We find ourselves in 1 Peter, if you would turn there, please. We're just going to look at a couple of verses this morning. I like um, to go through short books like 1 Peter because you feel like you can look at uh, verses in a slower way and you can sort of chew on them without taking big chunks of Scripture. Besides, i got to wait for my book allowance so that I can buy new commentaries for next year. So this First and Second Peter has to go through like the month of January. So, <laughs> chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you see why we just take small chunks? Because everything he says in these three verses needs to be chewed on, thought about, and meditated on. Lord, help us to um, rejoice in what you have said that you have done for us. Help me to preach it in such a way that you are honored and glorified, for it's in your name we ask it. Amen. Peter is writing this letter to people who are being persecuted. They were, he's already called them exiles. At this particular time in church history, the persecution wasn't um, throughout the Roman Empire, but in certain places. We don't know the extent of persecution that they were going through. Um, we know, for instance, from the book of Hebrews that there, there were some of them that were losing their homes and their property. Could have been something like that. Maybe some of them were going to lose their lives. That was certainly possible. Actually, in the next part of this same paragraph, Peter calls this a grieving when we are going through trials. That's a normal response is to grieve. We, for the most part, are not suffering great persecution here in America, though occasionally there might be some ostracism. Uh, there might be something more severe. But certainly every one of us as believers uh, go through difficult trials and tribulations. In fact, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 12, it says that, that those whom God loves, He disciplines. That is, He uh, trains us to become more godly. And so uh, the way that God does that is by taking us through grievous trials and tribulations so that we might be weaned away from this world and might depend upon Him, as Peter is going to talk about next week. Um, but there in Hebrews chapter 12, the author tells us that it's painful to go through these times, and we are all aware of that, that it is painful to go through these training exercises that God has in store for every believer. There are no exceptions to the rule. And so, we are either going to be grieving or that we are going to be in pain uh, different times in our Christian life. Now, you would think that Peter might start out knowing that that is what is going through his audience, that he might start out by saying, you know, I know that you're going through difficult times, and so um, I'm just going to pray for you, which would be a good thing to do. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. Uh, Peter could have said something like, I know you're going through difficult times, and I'm just really sorry that you're going through those difficult times. I mean, that's good. In fact, we are to sorrow with those who sorrow. He could have said that, and as I said, it would have been a good thing. But instead, Peter says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is encouraging these people who are enduring difficult times to praise God. Now, you might ask yourself, well, do you have another solution here other than praising God, Peter? It doesn't seem like much of a, of a, of a, of, of a solution to what we're going through, but it is. Um, you know, C.S. Lewis has written a book entitled Reflections on the Psalms. And uh, there were a time when C.S. Lewis was reading the Psalms where uh, it bothered him that the psalmist was always encouraging the audience, us, to praise God. It seemed to him that it made God to be selfish. Why does God always need all of this praise? And then the light came on for C.S. Lewis, and he realized that the psalmist is encouraging us to praise God not because God needs it. God is self-sufficient. But we are to praise God because we need it. You see, God has made us for something greater than ourselves. Now, you would think that people who are rich and famous would be the happiest people in the world. But most of them are miserable. Because at the end of the day, they climb this peak and they discover that it's all about me, but I'm still empty. I'm still not happy. As the great St. Augustine said, God has created us for himself, and until our hearts are one with his, we find no fulfillment. We have been created for something greater than ourselves. And praising God helps us to get there. You know, this is why Job must have understood this. When Job was going through, as you all know, he went through horrific trials, lost everything that was near and dear to him. And at the beginning of this, and of course, he would have been grieved, he would have been pained. And he says this, God gives, God takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He's in, he didn't really feel like praising God. But he knew that praising God is the ultimate solution to the pain that he was going through. And if you read to the end of the book, you discover that to be the exact truth. Where Job is wanting to have this dialogue with God, and God finally dissipates the fog and says, Okay, let's have this dialogue, Job. And Job comes to the end and he says, I have heard thee, now I see thee, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. So you see, when Peter says we are to praise God, this isn't some like little churchy thing that we do on Sunday morning, some nice little Christian thing that we do. This is, this is our heart and our soul as Christians. We are to praise our God for our own good. Do you understand? That is why the psalmist would berate his own soul. Oh, praise God, oh my soul. Even when I don't feel like it, especially when I don't feel like it, is when I need to. <clears throat> so, Peter now is going to tell us the reason why we should praise God. There are a number of reasons why we should praise God. And Peter is going to give us three, or at least I want to look at three of them here this morning. He says, the number one reason why we are to praise God is because he has caused us to be born again. He has caused us to be born again. You know the story well in John chapter 3 where Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and Nicodemus was one of the religious leaders of the day, and uh, he was saying something like, we know that you were a, a great teacher, thinking that Jesus would be impressed, that Nicodemus would say some complimentary things about Jesus. But Jesus stuns Nicodemus when he says this, unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I think there were two things that made it stunning to him. Number one is that 
I might not be going to the kingdom of God. I think Nicodemus thought to himself, I'm a religious leader. I'm in, like Flint. But, Peter, but Jesus is saying, no, you're not in like Flint. You must be born again. And Nicodemus was just, what? How can I be born again? How can I crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again? You're talking nonsense. But of course, Jesus wasn't talking about a physical birth. He was talking about a spiritual birth. You need to be born spiritually. How can that come about? Jesus might say, glad you asked. In just a few verses from there, he says, John 3.16, that everybody knows, do they not? Most people. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, Nicodemus, what you need to do is to believe that I am the Christ and I am the Savior, and you can have eternal life. You can't earn it. Uh, you can't do anything. It's a totally a grace type of thing. And so now, um, <clears throat> Peter uh, picks up on that. Um, and he actually tells us that before the belief takes part is that God is the ultimate cause of us being born again. Notice what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he, that is God, has caused us to be born again. And the reason why that has to be is because according to Ephesians chapter 2, we are spiritually dead. Dead. Um, a number of years ago, uh, I was sitting in on a licensure council. Our denomination ordains pastors, but before they become ordained, they have to be licensed. And so they have to write a paper interacting with our doctrinal statement and and so we're, uh, three or four of us seasoned pastors are quizzing this young upstart, and uh, in the course of the conversation, uh, we were talking about, so like before salvation, what was your spiritual state? And, um, uh, you know, somebody said you were spiritually dead, and one of my compadres who was actually doing the questioning said, well, you know, that doesn't mean that you're totally dead. It just means you're mostly dead. And I said, oh, you mean like on the Princess Bride? <laughs> Where the guy says, he's not totally dead, he's just mostly dead. He didn't find that very humorous, by the way. <clears throat> but I assure you that when it says that we are spiritually dead, it means we're incapable of responding to the call of Christ. Because the same word that is used there to describe our spiritual death is the same word that is used to describe Christ's death. And when Christ was upon the cross, he wasn't mostly dead. He was totally dead. So that when they stuck in the spear, out came blood and water to show that he was physically dead. And so were we. We were spiritually dead prior to our salvation. We were incapable of responding to the gospel call, though we were, it was inexcusable not to. Because in Adam, we all had our chance and we failed. And so it is God who has caused us to be born again. Um, why would he do that? Why would he cause us who are spiritually dead to be born again? Well, Peter says it. By his mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Mercy is different than grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. God gives us what we do not deserve. We deserve eternal damnation. Instead, he gives us eternal paradise. That's grace. Mercy is God's desire to help sinners who are in misery because of their sin. God loves to give help to sinners who are in misery because of their sin. That's what mercy is. 
You know, we have an, a, a fantastic illustration of God's mercy in the New Testament. It's called the prodigal son. You know, somebody has once said, really, the story should be called the prodigal's father. Because the story is probably more pointed towards the father than the son. You know the story well. The prodigal son takes his inheritance. He goes out and he spends it all. He ends up in a pig pen. And uh, he decides to come back home. At least maybe he can get some food from his dad. You know, actually, not that long ago, I was talking with a person who was not a believer. And he was struggling with the idea that God could love him as a sinner. And uh, so we, I took him to this story. And I said, let's read this together. And so we're reading it, and he reads the part where the son has taken all the stuff, and now he wants to come back. And I said, so what do you think the father did when the son came back? And the guy, without missing a beat, he says the father would beat him. I said, but let's read it just a little bit further. And he discovers that what really happens is this, is that when the father sees the son from a distance off, he is thrilled. And as the son comes close, he, he gives him a hug and says, this son of mine who was lost, now he is found. Let's throw a fantastic party. Brothers and sisters, that's mercy and grace wrapped up all together in one. That is the heart, you see, of our Father. That story is to convey to you and to me that the Father's, that's the, His heart towards sinners who have gotten themselves into trouble because of their sin. God loves to show mercy to them, and He did it to you and me when we deserved not a lick of it. We were the prodigal son. We had gone off and we had spent our inheritance. And then we, somewhere along the line, turned around and God has shown us mercy. Blessed be the God and Father who has caused us to be born again by his wonderful mercy. <clears throat> And the, the means by which this father has done that is through, as Peter reminds us, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, Peter sees a connection between the father and Jesus. And uh, the connection that he sees here is that Jesus as, as well as the Father is God. Now, I know that you know this, but we, we just need to see it here, is that he calls Jesus Lord. Um, there are only two words in the Greek language that I'm aware of that describe God. One is kurios, that is the translation Lord. The other is theos, that is the translation is God. And when Thomas sees the risen Lord Jesus Christ, he says, my Lord and my God. God, my kurios, my theos. Those are the words that he could come up with in the Greek language to describe that Jesus is God. Also, Jesus is called Christ. Uh, an Old Testament Jew, if he is studying his scriptures carefully, would understand that Christ had to be God. wasn't a created being. He wasn't an angel. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 9, it says the government will rest upon his shoulders and his name will be called eternal God. And that same word that is used to describe the coming Messiah is also used to describe Jehovah, Yahweh. So that if you're reading your Bible carefully, you would know that the Messiah has to be God. So then the question is asked, is so that if he is God, then why is he called son? He doesn't, he's not called son here, but, he is, but, it, but the Father is called uh, the Father, and so uh, obviously the implication is Jesus is the Son. And He is called the Son of God and the Son of Man. So if He is God, and Jesus said in John 10.30, I and the Father are one, in essence, whatever is true of the Father is true of me. So why is He called the Son? Uh, it is His role in redemption. Uh, in order to be able to redeem us, God had to become flesh. And the reason that God had to become flesh is because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. God in spirit cannot die. So God had to become flesh. 
And he had to become man, a servant of a man, because he had to succeed where the first Adam failed. And so Jesus Christ came to this earth in total submission to God the Father because, once again, he had to be the perfect man. He had to obey God perfectly. He had to succeed where Adam failed because God would only accept a perfect sacrifice. And the only one who could be perfect is the God-man. Therefore, in his role as Redeemer, he is called Son, not because he is created, but because he must be the obedient God-man to be the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. And so he goes to the cross as the perfect sacrifice. God the Father places his sin upon Jesus and, and crushes his own Son, He must die because that's the penalty for sin, is death. Uh, But because He is perfect after He had paid our, our sin, as Peter would preach in Acts chapter 2, after He had paid the penalty for our sin and died, death could not hold Him, not only because of His power, but because judicially. Because he is innocent, he could not remain uh, dead. And so Peter says he arose again from the grave. David talked about it in Psalm 16. And David isn't talking about his own resurrection because David's still in the grave. But Christ has raised again, demonstrating that his sacrifice was pleasing to the Father. And all who trust in that sacrifice are justified, treated as if we had never sinned. And God is the cause of it all. So God's people praise God, bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has caused us to be born again through our marvelous Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, sister. I hope the rest of you feel the same way. But now here's the second reason why we should praise our God is He has given us a living hope. Obviously, it's connected to the first point. A living hope. You know, somebody has said somewhere that you can only live 40 days without food. You can only live three days without water. You can't live but a few seconds without hope. I remember in my college days, uh, again, you know this, I majored in psychology, and, and so the professor talked about this experiment that they did with rats that I am sure they, they could not do today. PETA would be up in arms about it, but they would put a rat in a barrel of water, and the rat would swim around in the barrel. And hoping to get out of the barrel uh, and not drown. And then after the rat was swimming for a while, they'd put a lid over the barrel, and in short order, the rat would stop swimming and would drown. So the conclusion is, is that with the rat having no hope of getting out of the barrel, it just gives up. So the moral of the story is that even a rat needs hope. And so does mankind. We need hope. Without hope, people die. But you know, the interesting thing, stop and think about it for a moment, is that everybody, natural man, believer, unbeliever, everybody has a hope. But it's, if you're not a believer, it's a dead hope. It's a dead hope. You might be, I mean, a person might be thinking, you know, I have this hope of a better job, uh, a better relationship, uh, a better bank account, uh, a better this, a better that. But, you know, at the end of the day, it all dissipates. It all dissipates. It's not a living hope. It's a dead hope. Only the believer has a living hope because it goes on through eternity. But, you know, even a believer has a deferred hope. 
As it says in the book of Proverbs, a deferred hope makes the heart sick. Have you ever had a deferred hope? Of course. Everybody says, sir, I don't know, should, should I say yes? Or is that an unchristian thing to do, to say I have a deferred hope? Yes, we all have had deferred hopes. We had hoped for maybe better health, and we got bad health. We had hoped for better relationship with whoever, and it didn't pan out. We had hoped for a better job, didn't work. We had hoped for a better day, didn't turn out. We have big hopes, little hopes that become deferred. And what do we do when hopes are deferred? Because it says in Proverbs, it sickens our heart. We had hoped so much for that, and it didn't come to fruition. So what do we do? Well, one of my favorite passages of Scripture talks about deferred hope, and it's my, it's my good buddy, Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah uh, because this guy went through all sorts of deferred hope. Um, he had been given the task to preach the message to his own nation that God is going to uh, judge the nation and take everybody into exile. And nobody wanted to hear it. We want to hear about peace and prosperity, Jeremiah. Don't give us that message of coming judgment and sin. And uh, so nobody liked him. They put him in the mud. They tried to kill him. They burned things that he would write from God and so forth. And so he talks about it in Lamentations chapter 3. And his heart is so sickened, he says this, is that I have forgotten happiness and I have no hope, no hope. But then he goes on in just the very next passage, but this I recall to mind and therefore I have hope. Great is thy faithfulness, and thy loving kindness is new every morning. Therefore, I have hope. See, the reason why you and I have deferred hopes is because we tend to put our hope in temporary things. And what Jeremiah is reminding us to do is to put our hope in eternal things that neither moth nor rust can destroy. And so that whenever we are, brothers and sisters, whenever we're having an experience of a deferred hope and our heart is sick, it is God's call for us to praise Him that we have a living hope. And the living hope is God Himself, who will never leave us, never forsake us, and is always faithful to us. We need to believe it. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. Without hope, we can have no faith. The third thing that we are to praise God for, as I said, there are many things, but Peter here reminds us that we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading and kept in heaven for you who are protected by God's power. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've joked about this with some people is that I think I'm adopted um, and that my true uh, father is Warren Buffett. Um, I, you know, I've thought, you know, that would be pretty cool. Uh, Warren Buffett, um, as you would probably know, is the second wealthiest man in America. He is worth over $50 billion. That's with a B. Give or take a couple of billion doesn't really make any difference. And, uh, you know, I thought, you know, how that, that would be cool to, to be a son of Warren Buffett, I think. Uh, but there are, three, there are three things that could go bad about that. Number one is that Warren Buffett may not give me his inheritance if I were his son. You know, I actually heard an interview, it was on, I think it was on 2020, uh, about 15 years ago, um, and Warren Buffett lives up in Omaha, which is near our home territory at one time. Actually, I've driven by Warren Buffett's house. It's, it's very uh, plain Janish for a billionaire. I mean, I have to confess to you, if I were a billionaire, I'd have like a 40,000 square foot house with everything that you could possibly imagine. Um, his house would be smaller than this, which, I mean, it's big, right? But he's a billionaire. So it's pretty, pretty 
Jane Plainish, and uh, he would only do the interview if the interviewee would interview him at his favorite restaurant. Do you know what his favorite restaurant is? Close to it, Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen. Here's a billionaire eating at Dairy Queen. I don't know about you, but I would pick some more swanky place. And so in the course of the interview, they asked Warren Buffett, he said, so what are you going to do with your billions? Are you going to give it to your children? And he said something that just stunned me because now I'm his adopted child. You know, I'm looking for big bucks here. And he says, I'm not going to give any of my money to my children. He says, I'll pay for their college education and might give them a car, but they got to earn the rest themselves. And so there, my dreams are dashed. Even if I thought I was Warren Buffett's son, I heard, I've already got my education paid for. He's not going to give me anything. And so that's one of the problems about earthly inheritance. And even if I were to get it, I would probably blow a lot of it, or I could lose it in the stock market. Um, and besides that, I know for certain I could never take it with me when I die. You know, another very wealthy individual died, and somebody said, so how much money did he leave? And the person said, all of it. <laughs> he left all of it. But we have received an inheritance that is imperishable. Amen. Amen. And we already, we're, we're going, we're, we have already are tasting it, but one day we will experience it imperishable. It cannot be taken away from us, undefiled. We didn't get it by some slinky type of back door type of way. God has given it to us by His grace and by His justice, and it's unfading. It's never going to grow dim or boring. You know, I, I like that idea. It's, you know, sometimes, I think sometimes we as Christians think that heaven is going to become boring. I mean, after 10,000 years, I mean, like, really? I mean, like, what's, what are we going to do now after 10,000 years? But you see, it's unfading. And, and things here on earth tend to fade. <clears throat> um, several years ago, uh, I played on a golf course. As you know, I'm, I like golf, but I like outdoors things as well, so it didn't, it didn't even really have to be a golf course. But anyway, it was a golf course, and um, it was a beautiful morning like this morning. The sun was out, not a cloud in the sky, and this golf course was just pristine. It was immaculate. It was manicured to the hilt, and, and I'm the only one out there, and I'm just walking on this golf course, and I, I'm expecting any minute to see Thumper and Bambi coming out. It, it just looked like a scene from Walt Disney, and I just going, this is, this is just so wonderful, so beautiful. And I, I come around another corner, just like when I couldn't think it would get any more beautiful, it was like another scene that was even more beautiful, and oh. I want to go there now. But anyway, um, uh, a few years later, uh, we were up in the same area, and I thought, oh, I'm going to go back and golf on this golf course that was so beautiful. And I go, and it's like, you know, it's not as beautiful as I remembered it being. It's, why am I feeling, it's, it's the same golf course, it's not ratty or anything now, but it's just not the same buzz, you know what I mean? It had faded a little, and I'm sure it was partly my, you know, I faded a little. Um, and so it, it just, it was sort of disappointing, it's like, wow, but you know, heaven is not going to be like that. It's not, we're not going to get there the first day and go, wow, this is fantastic. And then 10,000 years later go, oh, the, you know, this is just sort of, or, is there another place we're going to go to, Lord? You know, No, it's never going to fade. Heaven is going to be a continual adventure. One of the reasons why it's never going to fade is because we're not fading. We're going to be glorified. And we're going to see God in all of his glory plus all of the creation plus one another and so forth. And so it's going to be a marvelous place. 
and this is what God has already guaranteed that you and I will have. Maybe that's why the Christians that we read about in Hebrews who said they joyfully accepted the seizure of their property, knowing that they have a greater property in heaven. You know, brothers and sisters, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm saying anything that alarms you. We may not be that far away from having all of our property taken. We may not be that far away from having our lives threatened. But even without that, we are certainly going to be continuing to experience trials and tribulations until Christ returns. And so Peter says, here's a good antidote when we feel discouraged, lonely, um, hopeless, praise God. It's not for His benefit, it's for ours. Reflect and remember the mighty things that our God has done for us. He has caused us to be born again by His mercy. He has given us a living hope he has given us an eternal inheritance, plus a whole lot of other things. But those three are great in and of themselves. So, again, when we feel overwhelmed by trials and tribulations, the antidote, praise God. Even when we don't feel like it, we have to berate our souls, like the psalmist says, Oh, my soul, praise God and I shall praise him. Let's pray.